Great, looks like we're live. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. It looks like we have 17 attendees. I expect a few more will join, but we're gonna get started. So good evening and aloha kako. I'm Natalie Gates and I have served as the superintendent of Haleakala National Park since 2013. Haleakala National Park is a unit of the National Park Service. The National Park Service, along with the State of Hawaii, Department of Land and Natural Resources, are collaborating on an important effort to save several species of native Hawaiian forest birds from extinction. The project we are presenting tonight is suppression of non-native mosquito populations to reduce transmission of avian malaria to threatened and endangered forest birds on East Maui. The purpose of today's meeting is to present the results of an environmental assessment or EA completed over this past year to address the major threats to our native forest birds on Maui. Those are invasive mosquitoes and the diseases they spread. We will share the purpose and need for the EA as well as the proposed action and potential impacts that might occur. I hope you have had a chance to review the EA. If you have not, please follow this link. We'll put that in the chat so that people can access it. Following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. During this Microsoft Teams live event, you will be in listen only mode. To submit a question at any time during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the ask a question box at the bottom of the page. You may submit questions at any time and we will address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Please be aware that questions and comments addressed after today's presentation are not considered formal comments on the EA. Please use the link in the chat to submit public comments through the project website. So what is NEPA? NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act, is a federal law which requires federal agencies, such as the National Park Service, to analyze environmental impacts and include the public before taking an action. HEPA, or the Hawaii Environmental Policy Act, is the state level equivalent of NEPA. NEPA and HEPA also ensure that the public are involved in the decision-making process. This occurs through public scoping, which happened last year, as well as comments on the NEPA HEPA document, which is happening right now. Chris? Hi, thanks so much for that, Natalie. Um, my name is Chris Warren. I'm the Forest Bird Program Coordinator at Haleakala National Park. The reason we are proposing these actions is because we are at a critical moment. Immediate or timely management action needs to be taken to prevent the extinction of federally protected forest birds on East Maui. Mosquito populations and thus avian malaria have recently expanded into higher elevation habitat, which is contributing to species rapid decline and inability to recover. Of the bird species unique to Hawaii, the most diverse group is the honeycreepers. Out of at least 20 species once found on the island of Maui, only six honeycreepers remain. Of those, two species, including the kiwi kiu shown here, are at significant risk of extinction within the decade. It's expected that other species will see major declines in that time period as well. The purpose of this project is to suppress invasive mosquito populations with the goal of addressing the effects of avian malaria on threatened and endangered forest birds on Maui. Mosquitoes are not native to Hawaii. The southern house mosquito was introduced to Hawaii for the first time by a whaling vessel in Lahaina in 1826. The upper left is a headline from the Hawaiian Gazette from April of 1903 describing this introduction. Avian malaria, like human malaria, is a disease caused by a parasite spread by mosquitoes. This disease was introduced to Hawaii in the early 20th century, likely contained in the blood of introduced birds. 
Because they evolved in the absence of malaria and the mosquitoes that transmit it, native Hawaiian birds, particularly the Hawaiian honeycreepers, lost the natural immunities their mainland ancestors may have had. As a result, many Hawaiian honeycreepers are highly susceptible to avian malaria, and a single bite can be enough to kill a bird. The result of this introduction was that native forest birds have been wiped out from the lower elevations where mosquitoes are found year round due to warm temperatures allowing them and the malaria parasite to reproduce. However, some bird species were able to persist at higher elevations that were, at least until recently, too cold for the mosquitoes and avian malaria. The proposed action in this environmental assessment uses a technique that results in mosquito eggs that do not develop. This technique involves releasing male mosquitoes that are incompatible with the females that are out in the forest now. When these two meet, the resulting eggs don't develop. As an added note, male mosquitoes do not bite. By inundating the mosquito population with, those, with these incompatible males, the mosquito population then crashes. The end result is fewer mosquitoes, and fewer mosquitoes means less risk of infection to the birds. The technique in the proposed action is known as the incompatible insect technique, or IIT. This method employs a particular bacteria called Wolbachia. Unlike the free-living bacteria that can cause human diseases, Wolbachia only lives inside the cells of another organism and cannot live outside these cells. This is an established technique that's been used around the world, including for agricultural benefits, and has been used safely and successfully to control mosquito populations in more than 10 countries around the world, including elsewhere in the United States. The vast majority of the mosquito suppression IIT projects have been to combat human, uh, mosquito-borne human diseases and often in urban areas. The proposed use of IIT does not include genetic engineering techniques, which could result in genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. On the right is an image of an insect cell, and those large circles highlighted in yellow within the cell are Wolbachia. Wolbachia was originally identified from mosquitoes, but has since been found in approximately 60% of terrestrial insects worldwide. Wolbachia is already naturally present in the fruit flies in your kitchen and the aphids and honeybees in your garden. Scientists discover that many different forms of Wolbachia exist in the world, even within the same host species. And sometimes those Wolbachia forms or strains cannot mix. And most importantly, they can prevent their hosts from reproducing too. As such, when a male mosquito with one kind of Wolbachia meets a female with a different kind of Wolbachia, they can't make any new mosquitoes. Here in the black outline is the project area for this environmental assessment showing land management. This is the area we analyzed for the impacts of this proposed action. The project area includes lands owned and managed by the National Park Service the State of Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, the Nature Conservancy, Haleakala Ranch, East Maui Irrigation, and Mahipono. To orient you here on this map, this is a zoom in of the eastern portion of Maui Island. On the right side is Hana, on the bottom is Kipuhulu and Kaupo, and on the upper left is the Mokawao area. This area is very large and thus it will be challenging to reduce mosquito populations across this entire area. For this action to occur, implementation plans would have to be crafted by partner agencies that would determine specific areas within the project area that can be effectively treated. As you can see, most of the project area is well away from human activities and mostly consists of remote forested areas. As such, we expect the primary method of delivery for the incompatible male mosquitoes will be by air. Aerial application of incompatible male mosquitoes can be done via drones or helicopters, but we expect drones to be the primary method of delivery on the landscape scale. Drones would allow for safe and efficient application with limited disturbance to the public and wildlife. 
The drone model for this application is yet to be determined and will depend on performance capabilities and agency approval. These pictures show some of the basic body types for drones that may be available. At this point, it seems likely that mosquitoes will be packaged, shipped, and released in biodegradable packets. The packets could then be loaded into a release mechanism, and then the packets would open upon contact with canopy or ground, thus releasing the male mosquitoes. The drones would be operated by licensed pilots, likely from launch sites accessible by road. The drone would then fly up the mountain and release mosquitoes at pre predetermined intervals. The number of releases per flight depends on the capabilities of the drone, specifically battery capacity and capacity of the release mechanism. The release mechanism attached to the drone could also be adaptable to be operated by a helicopter, either at the end of a cable or directly to the belly of the ship. However, given the current estimates of release frequency, we expect helicopter releases to be a temporary or short-term method. There would also be ground personnel involved in the project, primarily to monitor the mosquito populations through trapping efforts. These personnel could also release mosquitoes by hand along established management trails. However, we expect this method to be limited to small areas and less frequently than aerial methods. The monitoring is proposed at quarterly intervals and at a limited number of sites. One section of the project area in the western portion is accessible by ground and ground releases are possible here. However, drone release is still expected to be the primary method due to the efficiency and lower disturbance expected from using drones. As part of the environmental assessment, we also considered a list of alternatives to the proposed action, but ultimately dismissed those alternatives from further detailed analysis. This does not necessarily mean these actions are bad ideas or things that it cannot be considered in the future or as complementary actions. This list is just some of the alternatives explored, and I would direct you to the EA document itself for further on this topic. Among these dismissed alternatives are the use of chemical controls such as pesticides. No mosquito-specific pesticides are available, and thus the broad scale use of toxicants would likely have non-target impacts, including to native threatened and endangered insects. Thus, we dismiss this from further consideration here. There are a number of biological control products available on the market that target mosquito larvae. This has been used in localized control efforts, but application at the spatial scale we're looking at here would be challenging. And there are other tools similar to the IIT technique proposed here that do show promise, but those techniques are not available yet, and the birds simply cannot wait until that happens. Should some new technique become available that is better than what is proposed here, that may be considered in the future. But we feel it's important to act now with the tools that are available. A critical element to the environmental assessment is an analysis of the expected impacts from the proposed actions. Among those analyzed here are the expected impacts to visitor use, as well as an analysis of the soundscapes or the acoustic environment. These impacts include benefits as well as potential adverse impacts. From a benefit standpoint, the birds themselves are a big draw for visitors and residents alike. An increasing populations of the birds could result in more viewing opportunities. As for other impacts to the public, including visitors to the National Park or State Reserves, the majority of the project area already has limited public access. Most of the state forest reserves have limited access and we don't expect the project to impact uh, public access. Other areas are accessed by a permit only or without public access allowed at all. We don't expect any need to close additional areas or restrict public access for this project specifically. The public can go about their regular activities. The two areas that do see high visitor use are in the Kipuhulu District of the National Park and Makawa Forest Reserve. Visitors to any of the accessible areas may occasionally see drones flying overhead or helicopters transporting crews to remote monitoring sites. 
All aerial releases of the incompatible male mosquitoes will include aircraft moving swiftly over the canopy and not lingering over any specific spot. And the drones would be significantly quieter than helicopters. And finally, some project activities will occur in congressionally designated wilderness within the national park, which is roughly equal to 14% of the total project area. Another important consideration is impacts to threatened and endangered plants and animals within the project area. However, it's also important to note that not all impacts are necessarily negative, and we're expecting substantial public uh, positive impacts to many species from this action, including the prevention of species extinction. As for threatened and endangered plants, many of our native plants are bird pollinated and benefits to those bird pollinators will also be to the benefit of those plants. Ground crews conducting mosquito monitoring activities will be trained to identify threatened and endangered plants and provided locations of known individuals to avoid accidental damage to these plants. The affected animals, of course, include the honeycreepers that would directly benefit from the proposed action, although there may be some temporary disturbance from aircraft. Other animals in the area, like seabirds and opeapea, the Hawaiian hoary bat, are unlikely to be impacted as they are active in the project area at night, and the proposed action does not include night activities. These impacts and others are given much more thorough treatment in the environmental assessment document itself. Here we can see the schedule for the environmental assessment. The document itself was released last month in December, and we're in the public review period. So we are accepting public comments and I encourage you to do so. Uh, we are collecting those comments and analyzing them. Following that analysis, um, agency heads of the National Park Service and the State of Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources would come to a decision on the environmental assessment. And if it's approved, the project could uh, start as early as summer of 2023. And then lastly, we recognize that this would not be an easy undertaking. We feel strongly that it's well worth the effort. The good news is that even though some species are on the brink of extinction, they haven't yet passed that brink. We still have the birds. It's not too late. We can fix this. Thank you for your attention. I'll now pass the, the presentation over to Jen Harlow for the question and answer session. Aloha. We encourage you to comment on this environmental assessment. Comments or questions in this webinar are not considered formal comments. Formal comments can be submitted electronically through the project website, which is also in the chat, or by submitting written comments by mail. All comments must be received by Monday, January 23rd, 2023. In making public comments, what is most helpful are detailed comments on how to improve this project or including potential impacts or considerations that are not included in this environmental assessment. Please read the environmental assessment in full and that make sure that your comments are relevant to what's being proposed in this document. Make sure your voice is heard by reviewing the project website for detailed instructions on how to submit your comments. Thank you for listening to the presentation. We have now reached our question and answer session. Your lines will continue to be muted, so please use the ask a question box on your Microsoft Teams control panel to communicate with us. I'll read your questions out loud. Please note that your question will not be visible, but will be visible to us, and we will make sure to answer your question. If your question is not answered, uh, but you would still like to respond, you can comment in the environmental assessment. The first question that I have, um, Chris, if you're available for it. What is the mosquito packaging made from? 
And this is a multi-part question, so I'll ask the first part of it first. What is the mosquito packaging made from and how long does it take to degrade? Uh, thanks for that. And this is, um, I mean, it's a good question. The packaging is still being developed. And so what it's made of and how long it will take to degrade um, really depends on what that final design is. And uh, that may be, you know, part of the design if it, you know, original plans don't degrade as fast as we want or something like that. Um, so it's it's still in development now. So I, I, I'm sorry, I can't really provide specifics on that. Thanks, Chris. And the rest of that question, if you have any other information, um, what size are the packages? Who manufactures Manufactures the packaging, and how many mosquitoes might be contained in each package? Um, well, still the the size and how many mosquitoes that would uh, contain is still TBD, um, and may be dependent on what we need it to hold and the the size of the release mechanism and how we want it to be delivered um, to the canopy or the ground and things like that. So it, it's still kind of in development. And so unfortunately, I can't provide very um, good specifics for that yet. Thank you. And just a reminder, if you're just joining us or just tuning in, we are in the question and answer portion of our presentation today. If you are interested in submitting a question, um, you can select the ask a question um, box at the bottom pane and then submit your question. I will read it out loud. Another question that we have um, is for Natalie. According to the recently released Department of Interior strategy for preventing the extinction of Hawaiian forest birds, the National Park Service has already invested six million in fiscal year 22 in, into standing up an interagency field deployment team for Maui and development and initial production of Wabakia IIT. Does this mean no action alternative is realistically off the table versus proposed action? And why are other actions not listed in the EA? Thanks for the question. Um, so the no action alternative is a uh, legal requirement to include in any EA. Um, so uh, we included it. it. It would result realistically in the extinction of um, one to two species of honey creepers in the next two to 10 years. So um, it, 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 it pretty clearly does not fit the purpose and need of the document. Um, in terms of other actions, uh, the actions that we are proposing are all included in the document. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is horizontal transmission of the introduced bacteria strain has been documented in peer review studies of the Wabakia mosquito technique. Why was horizontal transmission not addressed in the environmental assessment? Was this directed at Chris? Yeah, Chris. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I would. I would first direct you to the, the project website and if you could provide any citations, I mean, that is part of the uh, this process here is, you know, we're collecting additional citations in case we haven't seen them. And that is a, a really important part of this process and we thank you for doing that. Um, we are continuing to look at all the available peer reviewed uh, studies out there and we'll take into account all of the um, the data that's available. Thank you. 
Um, again, if you're just joining us um, or if you um, are wondering what's happening right now, we are in the question and answer session of this presentation. And to submit your question, you can um, do so by accessing the bottom pane, ask a question and typing your question into the box. And I will read them out loud. The next question that we have is for Chris. What was the primary reason that genetic modifi modification of forest birds using CRISPR-CAS9 technology was dismissed as an alternative in the environmental assessment? Uh, yeah, that, that's Chris again. Thanks for that question. Um, the primary reason that it was dismissed here is that it does not meet the purpose and need of the project, which is to uh, suppress the mosquito populations. Um, but then it also is not available to us right now. So it's uh, somewhat of a moot point. Um, and we are, so it's not among the alternatives that we could realistically evaluate. And if we wanted to do that, it would require additional compliance. Thank you. Next question regarding the mark release recapture study mentioned in the environmental assessment. Why is the study necessary and when and where will it be occurring? Will incompatible mosquitoes be released as a part of that study? And this would be for Chris again. Yeah, um, that's great. You know, the, the mark release recapture study um, would, is part of the initial field trials, and we would learn really critical things uh, during those trials that would um, make sure that this method is as efficient as it possibly can be. Um, and at the moment, we are discussing um, not using IIT mosquitoes for this at all. Um, it would be, you know, again, only male mosquitoes released uh, in a small area, um, likely in the western portion of the project area that is uh, more readily accessible, um, but still away from uh, places that people access on a regular basis. Thank you. And our next question is for Cynthia. Um, I've read that in 10 countries, this has been successful and in Florida and California in the US. Yet it's not the same strain of mosquito that will be used in the project in Hawaii. Hawaii is thus a testing ground for a never before tried with this type of mosquito? Question mark. Hi, I'm Cynthia King. I'm entomologist for um, Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And, and yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's the, the short answer is no, that's not correct. Um, while it's true that Culex um, incompatible insect technique with Wolbachia hasn't been utilized in Hawaii, it has been used elsewhere in the world, uh, for example, in China and in Singapore. So, and um, those projects have focused on public health with the different mosquito species, as you mentioned, Aedes aegypti, which transmits human diseases like, like dengue. I mean, sorry, um, sorry, the Culex, I just mixed those up, but they have been used for Culex quinquefasciatus for public health um, because they transmit diseases like um, West Nile. Um, and in short, we're just utilizing the same approach for the purpose of conservation for avian malaria in this case. And I apologize for mixing those terms up. And would be happy to answer a follow-up question if there is one. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, the next question I have is for Lainey. Where can I find the studies that prove avian malaria is causing extinction in Hawaiian native, native birds? What is the percentage of avian malaria in birds now? Thanks, Jen. Hi, I'm Lenny Berry. I'm the Wildlife Program Manager at Hawaii uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. There's There's been considerable literature on um, the impacts of avian malaria on Hawaiian forest birds, particularly Hawaiian honeycreepers. 
Um, these are referenced in the environmental assessment. Um, there's been uh, there's ongoing research about the prevalence of avian malaria in the birds in the wild, uh, both native and non-native birds. Um, the the numbers vary considerably by area and by species. Um, it's way more prevalent uh, in lower elevations in warmer areas uh, where there's more mosquitoes and uh, up high uh, where there's more native forest birds. Um, it is uh, and, and fewer mosquitoes, there's a lot less avian malaria. Um, so there's no one number I can give you. Um, the other thing to remember is that it does tend to be relatively low in uh, native Hawaiian honey creepers, but the reason for that is a very really sad one. It's because when a Hawaiian honey creeper uh, contracts avian malaria, it dies very quickly. So we, we don't get uh, high prevalence in Hawaiian honey creepers because all those birds are dead. Thank you. Thank you, Lainey. Um, the next question I have is for Cynthia. How long will the releases be carried out for? What types of data will be collected to determine if the project has been successful? Hi, thanks for the question. So like a lot of our management actions that we take for the conservation um, of threatened and endangered species, if this project um, is, is undertaken and there is success um, in that we see significant suppression of, of southern house mosquitoes in forest bird critical habitat such that we see um, that the forest birds are thriving, this is an action that we would continue um, long term, just like we do ungulate control or weed control or rat control in areas where we're trying to restore these critically endangered species. So um, the answer is if it's successful, it could go, go on for in, in the near term. Um, and the hope is if we are successful that the mosquito populations would be reduced in such a way that releases could be less frequent and in much smaller numbers as well to keep the populations at a consistently low number rather than having to bring down these huge peaks and fluctuations in the population. And we're working really closely with partners at US Geological, um, at US Geological Survey, um, Biological Resources Discipline, um, that will be helping us take the lead on what monitoring and um, what data, what monitoring is conducted and what specific data are collected in the field. But um, a lot of what we'll be looking for is, um, is, um, is how many male and female mosquitoes can be detected on the landscape, um, how many eggs we're finding if we put out um, sentinel larval habitat, you know, basically um, water sources that we can then check them and, and see what eggs and larvae are, are, are being produced and um, use all of those data to inform um, an adaptive management plan as we continue to try and make this um, tool as effective for the forest birds as it can possibly be. Thank you, Cynthia. And the next question is also for you. How will the mating competitiveness and survival of the IIT males be measured before releases begin? Um, the short answer is the mosquitoes can only be studied in the laboratory um, before any releases begin, which is understandable. Um, what, what we what, what researchers look for is, is fitness, which is their ability to mate, to lay eggs, to, um, to, to live a, a certain amount of time, longevity. And so a lot of um, factors um, and pieces of information are, are, are captured as, as these laboratory colonies are maintained. Um, there are fitness costs, though, to um, having the you know, a different strain of Wolbachia and being kept in lab conditions. So ultimately, the mosquitoes that we have, while well, they will be suitable to survive enough to find a mate, last a few days to find a mate, um, uh, in inhi inhibit that reproduction of wild males, uh, females on the landscape, they won't survive for a long time in the field. Their their lifespan is going to be very fairly short after they um, 
after they mate as we would like them to do. And so, um, there, yeah, there are slightly reduced fitness costs, which is also why we um, want to be able to provide more of those uh, males on the landscape than what the ratio would normally be just in a normal um, existing wild population. Thank you, Cynthia. And if you're just joining us um, or if you'd like to submit a question, um, you can submit a question at any time by accessing the pane at the bottom that says ask a question and typing your question into the box and I will read that question out loud. Um, we do have more questions to get to, so we'll keep on going. Um, the next question I have is for Chris and will the mosquito population be monitored after releases to ensure that IIT Wabakia strain has not become established in wild females? That is a great question. Chris, it seems that your connection isn't very good. Um, Cynthia, do you mind jumping in on that question? Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was just m what I was hearing, but um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I should have included it in my answer, my previous answer at what might have clarified that. So yes, certainly um, along with the collaborators at uh, USGS and also I neglected to say University of Hawaii, um, we will certainly be uh, looking at um, sampling mosquitoes and looking at which Wolbachia strains they carry um, to ensure that if there were to be any um, releases of, of lab-reared female mosquitoes that we would be um, detecting their presence in the environment. So there is going to be a lot of monitoring, a lot of analysis, a lot of laboratory testing associated um, with this project, and there are a lot of funds that are already allocated for that. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, the next question I have is for Doug. How is this project able to proceed under the environmental assessment of the National Environmental Policy Act instead of a more comprehensive environmental impact statement? Yeah, thanks. This is Doug, Doug Wetmore from the National Park Service. Um, well, NEPA regulations state that the uh, agencies are, will be preparing an, an environmental assessment for an action that's not likely to have significant effects. At this point, we have the NPS and DONR have not identified any significant effects of the proposed action. So we think the EA is the proper NEPA pathway. However, this is the appropriate time for the public to be submitting formal comments on this to our, our project website to you know, identify or tell us some things that we may have missed. And, and we'll make a, de a decision on, on those items as we go through the NEPA process. It's, it's not finished yet, we're just at near the end of it, but at this point we take things into consideration and then if we identify significant effects, we would have to um, prepare an EIS. And if we do not, um, then we move forward and sign something called a finding of no significant impact. So. Um, if there's stuff out there that the public thinks we have missed, by all means, please submit it to the project website before January 23rd. Thank you, Doug. And if you I want to submit a formal comment, you can go to the website that's listed in the chat. Um, and also uh, we've shown it a few different times and we'll show it again one more time if you'd like to write that down. Comments are also accepted by mail by January 23rd, 2023. The next question I have is for Cynthia. And the question is, why is there no consideration of sterilizing females prior to release? Thanks for that. Um, so other, other projects have looked to that um, as a way of, of double checking to, to ensure that any females, if released, would be sterilized. There can be fitness costs to that. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, especially very low doses of radiation that can sterilize females can actually, um, it, it, it's a, a big fitness loss to the males, that same amount. 
Um, and so I think that there is actually ongoing research to look at how you could um, how you could utilize that um, in a really, really specific way. Uh, the projects that used that, though, it was because all of the sorting was being done by hand, actually, um, th through big sieves and sort of more traditional laboratory practices. Um, and since then, more specialized approaches, more technologically advanced approaches using computer learning and really, um, really technical um, software has enabled such a high degree of accuracy with the sex, sex sorting that essentially um, we don't believe that having that additional layer of irradiation is going to give us a benefit given the potential cost it could also cause to the fitness of male mosquitoes. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, the next question I have is for Lainey. Have Hawaiian honey creepers developed some resistance to malaria? Hey, um, thanks. Yes, there is some evidence that, well, there's there's definitely um, some species that are perhaps naturally more um, resistant to avian malaria. There seems to be some variation amongst the Hawaiian honey creepers um, um, to avian malaria, uh, particularly in the Amakihi. Um, th that may have been a natural, like, you know, the may have, those species may have been naturally a little more resistant from, um, we're not quite sure, it's hard to, it's hard to say. Um, it does seem like there is some populations of, especially um, Hawaii Amakihi on the Big Island, um, and even um, perhaps Molokai that have developed some resistance, which is really exciting. Um, there is some research by the US Geological Survey um, about um, resistance in these populations. So in short, um, yes, it does seem like, at, at least in some species, there may be some resistance developing. They still seem to be, the, the, the honey creepers as a, as a whole are still highly susceptible to avian malaria though. So, um, and it's, not something that we're seeing in across the board across all the species. Uh, right now, you know, the vast majority of Hawaiian honey creepers are restricted to elevations where we don't have Culex and therefore avian malaria. They just are unable to survive uh, anywhere where there's Culex. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is for Doug. In the Kapaka I, I'm sorry, in the Kapa'a Ka'ai analysis, there were six Kanaka Maole interviewed. They had concerns. Yet in the last meeting, you explained why their concerns were not included. Doug, can you elaborate on this? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> this is Doug Wetmore. Um, yeah, all of the concerns that we received um, from in, in any part of the, the the consultations that we do as part of the NEPA HEPA project are going to be located in the for for the consultation and under um, you know for um, cultural resources will be in um, the CIA, which is an appendix um, in the in the NEPA document right now. Um, we have been working very closely with the state on this. And we have taken all these concerns, you know, into consideration. Um, and and you can read about it more in the EA appendix that discusses for pages on on what these individuals' concerns were and groups' concerns were, cult from a cultural resource standpoint, and why. Well, although there were concerns, the Park Service and DLNR didn't decide to analyze the cultural impacts to the fullest extent. And I think. You'll find a really much better answer in the EA than I can provide in in 20 seconds here. So I'd encourage you to go there. And if that's not satisfactory, please submit a comment to the project website and we can um, take it into consideration you know, throughout the NEPA HEPA process. Thanks, Doug. And you're referencing Appendix C, the Cultural Impact Assessment, which is on page 117 of the document that you can download on the, the project website. Yes, that's correct. And there's also a, a thorough discussion of all cultural resources 
in Appendix B, um, the considered but dismissed appendix. So you'll find a lot of information there as well. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is for Cynthia. Has a study been done related to mosquito release and wind drift? Oh, thanks for that. Um, we have not conducted a study with Culex mosquitoes and wind drift specifically in advance of this IIT uh, proposed project. Um, however, uh, researchers at USGS have done dispersal studies with southern house mosquitoes, and so we do have an understanding of how mosquitoes can um, move across a, a land, a, an area, um, you know, areas that were studied were on Big Island in that case, um, move across an area, what their sort of general um, average dispersal distances were and maximum, which directions they went, um, if they preferred to be along sort of um, open corridors or, or, or and how they moved when it was more closed forest. So that some folks have looked into that and certainly we have wind models that will be um, taking close, um, looking at really closely um, if the project moves forward and we are actually looking at deployment because um, because obviously we know winds are are um, very important in that. Thank you. And if you'd um, like to submit a question, you haven't done so yet, um, you can do that by accessing the pane that says ask a question and typing your question in. The next question we have uh, is when and where can we see the 258 comments submitted by the December 30th deadline? And that's for Lainey. Hi, I'm I think that December 30 deadline is in reference to a, a different process. That's the um, application for emergency exemption um, to the EPA. Not uh, the, this, the deadline for this um, environmental assessment is January 23rd. So just to be clear, um, so that was that was for the emergency exemption application to EPA, which is a separate but related uh, process. And the question was. Sorry, um, where can we see the comments? You can see them um, on regulations.gov. Uh, I believe you can do a search. I, I've got the website, but it's kind of difficult to read out. Uh, but the docket number, if you just do a search for the docket, um, that is EPA-HQ-OPP-2022-0896. So you can find, and it's, I'm seeing 222 comments. Um, not sure if that was, you know, that's, that's what I'm seeing. So hopefully that's what you're referring to with the December 30 deadline. Thank you, Lainey. I can answer the question, the second part of the question, Jen. Um, this is Doug again from Park Service. Um, the January 23rd deadline for the EA, um, Obviously, we're still collecting comments on that right now, and so um, as a matter of practice, we don't release, we don't have those comments available right now, but what we do, what we will do when we um, make our decision final, we'll, we'll publish um, a summary of those comments on our, on our project website, so you might just stay tuned for that. Um, you know, for, for a public comment summary near the end of this process. So. Thanks, Doug. And while we have you, there's another question that we have. Will, will there be further open and speaking permitted public scoping meetings planned? Yes, Doug, again, there are no, these are the only two public meetings for the EA that are being held. Um, but there's obviously the opportunity to submit comments, as we mentioned, um, on the project website, which is where it really becomes important. And we can um, take those into consideration when we, you know, finalize the EA and move on in the NEPA and HEPA process. So. Thank you. Cynthia, this next question is a follow-up to a response you gave to an earlier question. 
Did you say Wabakia IIT was used in China and Singapore? Can you verify this is correct? Hi, yes, I can definitely verify that it's correct that it was used in China and Singapore, although I'm happy to get back to you with the specific specifics of which species. Um, certainly, I know that uh, Culex IIT did take place in China. I, I'm sorry if I misspoke about Singapore. I was actually just trying to check that right now. And so if anyone else uh, knows that off, of the top, off the top of their heads and wants to chime in, please do correct me. I think most of the Singapore trials and studies were with 80s Egypti. Yeah, I think you're correct on that. So I apologize for misspeaking about that. Thank you for clarifying. Um, the next question I have is for Doug. If there is no majority, no decision by the community as evidenced by the comments submitted, will this really be stopped? Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, HIPAA and NEPA are not um, voting mechanisms. It's uh, procedural processes that we follow that have heavy public engagement, and that's what we're doing now. So if a thousand people say no and a thousand one people say yes it's not like we're, we we say oh we might we got to go with the yes it's just that we take the the substantive comments from the public and try to improve the process as much as we can so um voting for or against something at this process this this stage of the process doesn't really um help us make it better we take all your concerns um on the on the website into consideration and and make improvements to to the project um but we present all this information to our agency heads and and the decision makers and so if they have some sort of issue with the project they can you know not approve it or approve it with changes or recommend things so um it's really just a way for the public to interact and and make sure that you know we're not missing anything and that that if they're are concerns that we have them and this information is certainly um, taken extremely seriously and provided to the decision makers for HIPAA and NEPA. Thank you, Doug. The next question we have is the mosquitoes will have to survive many hours of travel to get to Maui from the continent and the EA mentions the transport has been shown to have negative effects on mosquito survival. Have previous IIT projects had to work with such long travel times? And is a mosquito rearing facility being constructed in Hawaii? Um, this question can be for Chris or Cynthia. Uh, this is Chris. I'm, I'm happy to take at least the first part of that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating how some of these projects have operated with long shipping. Um, there's been a project in Puerto Rico that, even though it's not quite as far, but shipping mosquitoes from California to Puerto Rico. There's projects in the Virgin Islands right now. Um, so it is a, a potential challenging aspect of this, um, and we're trying to figure out the, you know, the best routes for shipping um, and how we can get them out on the landscape as quickly as possible to reduce those effects. Um, yeah, Cynthia, do you want to speak to the second part of that? Sure. Um, I, sorry, was the second part related to if a facility is being constructed here in Hawaii at this time? Yeah. Okay, so at present, no, that's not the case. Um, we believe right now that the most efficient um, way, even though it, it it does sound logistically challenging, um, but the most efficient way for, for the birds is to not wait for a facility in, in Hawaii. Um, that said, we will have um, places that the mosquitoes will be, um, you know, shipped through, like the port of Honolulu, uh, the, the port of Kahu Kahului or Kahui Airport and also Lihue. 
Um, and so they will undergo um, be received, undergo inspection and then move on to <clears throat> a holding facility before they um, are transported um, to the um, high elevation, you know, remote areas where the where the treatment where the applications would be completed. So <clears throat> I think in the long term, if this project is successful, um, many of you, many of us believe that having a facility in Hawaii uh, could be ideal to try and reduce some of those logistics and costs. Um, but uh, because uh, um, you know brick and mortar infrastructure is 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 expensive and and slow to build, that's not something that's a part of this project at this time. Thank you both. The next question I have is for Lainey. Is captive care an effective strategy for preventing the extinction of native birds? If so, why were building and staffing of ca captive care facilities not the focus of budgeting for this project? Sure. Um, it can be a strategy. It, 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 it is part of our strategy uh, for Hawaiian birds, Hawaiian forest birds in general. Um, it can be a, a strategy in certain situations, but for example, the Alala is currently extinct in the wild, um, and we the only Alala in existence in the world are in captive breeding facilities on uh, Big Island and in Maui. Um, so, you know, we, we would not have that species today if if it weren't for the captive breeding uh, program um, that is currently run. Um, it is uh, for Hawaiian honey creepers. Um, we have not had as much success in breed, you know, keeping them um, you know, in captivity, uh, breeding, uh, keeping a viable breeding population in captivity. There's been many efforts over many years, different species. Um, they are just not as easy to keep and particularly breed in captivity as other, other species. Um, so it's not, we, we don't really regard this as an effective long-term strategy and our ultimate goal is always um, to have a viable thriving population of these species in the wild. Um, we don't want these birds to be in captivity in perpetuity. So while it can be a tool um, in certain circumstances to, to prevent extinction um, for a limited time, we, we don't want it to be our only option. We want to avoid that. We want them to be thriving in the wild. We want to address the threats that in the wild that are uh, causing them to be endangered. Um, and then you asked about funding. Uh, we did receive substantial funding from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service um, in, uh, in recently to expand the breeding facilities. So it was in the budget. Not just it's just not part of this um, environmental assessment. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is for Chris. What degree of accuracy is projected with sex sorting using new technology? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the the estimate um, right now is that the likelihood that a female would be released is one out of 900 million mosquitoes released. So it is, it's quite accurate. Thank you. And the next question we have is for Doug. Can we see the public comment summary before you make your final decisions? Yeah, this is Doug. The short answer to that is no. Um, we are going to, we would include the summary of public comments when we re, um, complete the NEPA and HEPA process as part of that, the final decision documentation. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how often will the public be informed of the progress of this project should it go forward? And um, to answer that question, I can go ahead and jump in. Um, we've done quite a bit of work to inform people along the way of what's happening with the forest birds. Um, we also have many partners that are working on this project, a group called Birds Not Mosquitoes, um, that have a very engaged community outreach group 
um, making sure that the public is aware of the successes and challenges that may be associated with this project. Um, you can find more information going forward on the park website, um, also on our park social media as well, um, and then anyone associated in the Birds Not Mosquitoes group as well. Um, the next question I have is, oh, and I'm sorry, if, you, if you'd like to submit a question, please go ahead and um, click the ask a question at the bottom of the pane. Um, you can type your question in and I will read them out loud. Um, the next question I have is, is there funding in perpetuity from the MPS and this project will cost a lot of money? Why isn't the same effort and funding used to eliminate feral cats and mongoose? And even better to perpetuate Kanaka Maole mindset and Ahupua'a cultural practice. Consultation with Kanaka Maole is crucial to Native Hawaiian people are endangered of extinction. So Jen, I can take a stab at that. Um, so there's uh, multiple parts to that that question, so I'll see if I can get all of it. Um, is there funding in perpetuity uh, from NPS for this project? Uh, no, there is no funding in perpetuity for anything um, in the federal government. Uh, however, we do have a substantial startup funding and we hope to receive some more. Um, as I stated at the last meeting, uh, we expect that the populations of mosquitoes will decrease uh, over time. That is the purpose of this project. And therefore, the funding required, the number of people required in the field, and the overall effort should decrease with time. That is what we're hoping. Um, in terms of other uh, causes of uh, Hawaiian bird extinction, uh, and the, the question points uh, to mongoose and other predators, um, that is correct. Uh, we continue to con try to control those with other programs. So for instance, the National Park Service uses uh, fencing and uh, directly tries to control non-native predators in order to protect native Hawaiian birds, and those efforts will not cease. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is for uh, Cynthia. How long do female mosquitoes live? Hey, so t mosquitoes typically take about seven to 10 days to go from egg to adult. <clears throat> and then once they are in the adult stage, females and males um, in captivity, for example, can live a little bit longer, males a couple weeks, females up to maybe even like one month to two months, even if they're being fed every day and taken care of. In the wild, we don't expect them to live quite as long. Um, uh, usually males would live less than a week and females would live something like two weeks, um, I believe. Um, but I know that there is uh, literature out there um, that, um, that, that might describe that more specifically. Thank you. And just a reminder, um, although we are in this question and answer portion, um, these questions that are submitted during the public meeting are not considered formal comments. If you wish to ask a question or submit a form formal comment, um, you can do so by accessing the project website um, and submitting it online, or you can submit it by mail by January 23rd, 2023. If you'd like to ask a question now during the public meeting, um, you can do so by selecting the ask a question um, panel at the bottom and typing your question in. Um, the next question we have is for Chris. Where can we see documentation of the estimated number of accidentally released lab bred females? What are the, why are these figures not in the environmental assessment? Yeah, thanks so much. That that figure comes specifically from a citation of uh, Crawford and colleagues from April of 2020 in Nature Biotechnology. Um, I don't have the full citation here to plunk in there, but um, it, the title is Efficient Production 
of male while blocking infected 80s Egypti mosquitoes, enables large scale suppression of wild populations. So as the title does say that those numbers are for 80s Egypti, um, but the process is being adapted um, for Culex. And I would expect that we would see some very similar number. Um, I do know that the AI um, technology, the machine learning technology has adapted quite well to Culex um, and they're already seeing um, the same sorts of uh, the same numbers or similar at least. Um, and that that process eliminates a lot of mosquitoes, even ones that even remotely look like um, a female. Um, and there is extra uh, care taken after the machine learning to have humans look at that. And if there is anything that looks like a female, an entire vial could be um, or is is trashed um, to make sure that that is a low probability. Thank you, Chris. Um, the next question we have um, is also for you. How will shipments of male mosquitoes be quality controlled? Um, I'm not sure if I can necessarily answer that. I think that um, certainly this is a really important part of this, not just for safety, but for efficacy of the project and this would be part of the procedures that would be written up for this project specifically and I'm sure there would be you know stop gaps written into that um, and so I, I guess I, I don't know how to answer it right now but uh, there will be um, quality control measures all along the way um, just to make sure that this is as safe and as and efficient as it could possibly be. Thank you. Um, if anybody else has questions, please at this time use the ask a question pane at the bottom of your screen and you can submit your questions and I'll read them out loud. And we'll just give it a moment to see if there's any new questions coming in. If you've submitted a question, you haven't heard your question answered yet, um, just know that we are answering questions that are directly related to the environmental assessment. Questions outside the scope of this proposed project will not be addressed at this time. Um, if you'd like to formally submit a question or comment, you can do so by submitting it on the website or a written comment. Again, if you have a question, please go ahead and submit it into the ask a question um, at the bottom of the pane and type your question in and we can read them out loud. The next question I have um, is for Cynthia. If a female mosquito can live up to eight weeks, how many female mosquitoes 
can that one mosquito produce in her lifespan? Um, that's a great question. And just to clarify, a, a mosquito being fed nectar water and protected from all predation and and everything in a in a mesh cage is very different than longevity on the landscape. But um, to the actual to the other the second part of the question, what's really remarkable about this species, the southern house, house mosquito, is they actually only mate and and use the sperm of the male one uh, of one male. So they might continue to lay eggs over their lifetime, but in this case, um, if a wild female um, that's present in the Hawaiian forest mates with an incompatible male, she will never over her lifetime produce viable offspring. So it's not that she has to keep finding incompatible males, it's that that one mating event will prevent her from provide, uh, having any, any offspring um, during her life. Um, as for, I, I can't actually speak off the top of my head to the total number of offspring that would otherwise be produced, um, but it's certainly in the high hundreds. Thank you. Um, the next question, Cynthia, is also for you. Is Wabakia expected to work on other mosquito species? Um, so I think if the question is, would Wolbachia IIT as an approach work with other mosquito species? The answer is, is yes, definitely. The way this method has been pioneered is using um, this method in mosquitoes of public health concern, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, um, which transmit diseases to humans. So certainly um, it's a, a system that's been studied and understood primarily because of the potential benefits for humans and um, the ability to interrupt um, um, our infectious disease transmission to people. Um, and um, I guess on the on the other side of the question, um, you know, Wolbachia is already present in mosquitoes, in Culex mosquitoes um, in Hawaii. Um, it, it's a different strain of Wolbachia from what the incompatible males will have but we already have mosquitoes that are present in Hawaii. We already have mosquitoes that are present with Wolbachia in Hawaii, both the Aedes species and Culex species. Um, and so we know that it is a, a bacteria that lives within them that is that is obligated. It can only live within them um, uh, as a symbiont um, and does not otherwise cause any problems for um, the mosquitoes or for humans or for the environment um, in their natural in their natural state. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, as a reminder, if you would like to submit a question, you can do so um, by clicking on the Ask a Question pane and typing in your question. Please note that any questions that you submit um, during this question and answer session um, are not considered formal comments or questions. If you'd like to formally submit a question or comment, please visit the project website or mail your comment in by January 23rd. The next question that I have is for Chris. Why is the higher elevation area of the project area not the main focus of mosquito eradication for this process project? Thanks. Yeah, this is a this is a good question. Um, for this to be successful, we would need to release the incompatible males where breeding of the mosquitoes is occurring. And although we know that at least female mosquitoes are reaching birds at some of the highest elevations that the birds occur at, um, there are still temperature limits to the reproduction of the mosquito and particularly of the malaria parasite. Um, should we find that mosquitoes are breeding at higher elevations than is currently thought, um, or the mosquito breeding starts occurring at higher elevations due to uh, climate change, as has been the trend, then uh, we could uh, start doing releases there. So. The point is that it needs to be applied in the places that the mosquitoes are breeding and most likely focused on areas where those mosquitoes are then going and infecting 
the most critically endangered birds. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is for Cynthia. What is a native predator of the southern house mosquito? Thanks for that. Um, an, a predator that's native um, for the southern house mosquito in its native range, which is not Hawaii because all mosquitoes are non-native to Hawaii. So the southern house mosquito is native to sort of the southern United States and into um, Central America and, and the Caribbean area, um, I believe. And a lot of different organisms can eat them in their native range. Um, as larval, in, in the larval stage, they can be eaten by um, fish. Um, they can be eaten by other aquatic insects and other aquatic insect larvae. Um, you can think of dragonflies um, um, and, and all sorts of um, aquatic insect species that we actually don't have here. Um, um, when they're in their adult stage, they can be eaten by a variety of other of other insects, as well as um, some birds and bats in the areas that they're native to. Um, in Hawaii, though, we've only had this, this species, this other house mosquito here since um, 1826. So it's, it's really just been a couple hundred years. And most of our endemic Hawaiian species have evolved um, over millions of years in the islands, or at least hundreds of thousands. And they have evolved without the presence of mosquitoes. So we don't have any organisms, any native insects, native birds, or, or our native bats. None of them rely on mosquitoes as a prey base uh, to survive. Um, it's an invasive species that <clears throat> if it were, if the populations were controlled, will not have any detrimental impacts to our native species. Thank you. And Cynthia, uh, another question on mosquitoes. What percentage of the existing wild mosquitoes carry Wolbachia bacteria? What percentage of the existing southern, I'll answer the question with what percentage of the existing southern house mosquitoes carry Wolbachia? And that is 100% um, that are present in Hawaii already have a strain of Wolbachia within them. Um, and what we're proposing is to utilize an uh, incompatible mosquito that just happens to have a, a different strain of, of Wolbachia that would make their mating um, impossible or create an incompatibility between uh, the males and the females. Thank you. Um, if you have any other questions, please make sure to submit them uh, by typing your question in, you can access that by the bottom pane of your screen and um, clicking on ask a question and typing your question in. Um, I'll just pause to see if there's any remaining questions to come in. Again, I'm just pausing to see if there's any other questions for the question and answer session. And you can submit your question at any time by clicking on the ask a question um, pane and then typing your question into the box and I will read your question out loud. As a reminder, if you have a comment or question that you would like to be shared formally and considered in the environmental assessment, please make sure to submit it to the environmental assessment on the website or by written comment by January 23rd.
And we have an additional question uh, for Lainey. Um, this seems to echo a question that you had answered earlier in the call. Um, is transportation of the native birds to other islands an effective strategy for preventing extinction? If so, why was this not the focus of budgeting for this project? Yeah, I'll answer this question. Um, so we have been investigating the, the feasibility of translocation of particularly the Kauai and Maui uh, species. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that, you know, in the long term, you know, and we're, we're trying to look long term for the you know, long term viability of these species, not just the next five, 10 years. Um, th there really is not great prospects on any of the islands. Um, you know, the, the, the species are most critically endangered on Kauai and Maui. Um, on Big Island, they, the, you know, similar species are doing better, um, but there's, there's still a lot of endangered species on Big Island. There is, if we take into account climate change um, and the, you know, the, the changes in distribution of uh, these mosquitoes and therefore avian malaria, um, it doesn't give a whole lot more time um, for these species. So really, we don't have um, we we don't have um, really we, we we would prefer that the species be um, conserved in their native home ranges uh, if that's possible, and that's that's what we're aiming for. Um, translocation is still something that we are uh, looking into as an option, and obviously, obviously that's outside the scope of this EA. But please be assured that this is something that the state and Fish and Wildlife Service is actively investigating as an option. Um, so it's, yes, it, it is an alternative. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by not a focus of budgeting for this project. That's a separate, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm just reading the question again to make sure I've uh, answered it correctly. Yeah, that's that's all I've got to say, yeah. Thank you, Lainey. Um, and as a reminder, uh, we will be concluding this presentation and public meeting at 7 p.m. So if you have a question that you would like answered during this presentation, um, please go ahead and submit your question now. Um, we'll get to as many questions as we can um, before we close out and end at 7 o'clock, which is in about seven minutes. To ask a question, you can submit it by clicking on the Ask Question pane and typing your question in. Um, the next question I have is for Chris. On page seven of the Mosquito Free Report, it states current sex separation techniques are not 100% effective. Chris, can you speak to this comment question? Yeah, um, and we did talk about this a little bit before, but to, to reiterate, the, the sex sorting and making sure that females are not released or fe female contamination, um, that is that is a really important part of this process for it to be effective. Um, but it, no, it, it's not 100%, but the current estimate using the tools that we've been discussing here are one out of 900 million. And speaking as a scientist, you'll, you'll almost never hear a scientist say there's a zero probability, but it is a very, very low number. Thank you. The next question I have is for Cynthia. Has the Asian tiger mosquito been a threat to honey creepers? Um, sorry, has the Asian tiger mosquito been a threat to honey creepers? So the Asian tiger mosquito, mosquito is able to transmit um, avian pox, which is another disease that does affect the honey creepers. Um, but my understanding is um, that it is not the most significant mortality factor uh, when it comes to the survival of the forest birds. Avian malaria is a much, much more significant issue. Um, and, and Aedes albopictus is not a very good vector of avian malaria. Um, so it, yeah, so to answer the question, Asian tiger mosquitoes are a threat to honey creepers as well. And <clears throat> we have included that information um, um, as as DLNR has 
has um, has continued to propose uh, using IIT as a tool um, that it could be used for for bird conservation in, in that way as well. This is Chris, just to, to add to that, the distribution of the Asian tiger mosquito is also not nearly as elevationally broad as Culex. And so um, they they do have some effects like at, like what Cynthia mentioned with Avapox. It is more of a maiming disease, which is it's certainly not pretty, but mortality is not very high. Um, but it's, it's an effect of birds at pretty low elevations where these mosquitoes are um, much more common. It's only really the Culex quinquefasciatus that carries avian malaria that's reaching the birds at the highest elevations. Thank you. And Chris, if you can stay on, the next question we have is, um, the environmental assessment does not contain data regarding climate change. Where can I find data that proves mosquitoes are breeding at higher elevations? There are um, a number of different agencies that are trapping for mosquitoes at different elevations and various reports and citations um, show that. Uh, there's also been pretty extensive modeling from USGS and others looking at the uh, temperature range that is suitable for breeding of both the mosquito and, uh, and avian malaria parasite. And we can project using um, established or well-published climate change scenarios how that distribution has changed and will change. Um, I know from personal experience that places that did not used to have mosquitoes even a few years ago, uh, you can often find quite a number of mosquitoes um, right now, and it, it is pretty tragic. And not only that, but you can, um, we're in many places, we're watching the birds disappear. Thank you, Chris. Um, we are approaching the end of our webinar. Um, I, I don't see any new questions at this time, um, but if we did not get to a question or if you didn't have the opportunity to ask a question, um, just as a reminder, um, you can still submit your question or comments uh, formally by visiting the project website or mailing your comment in. Okay, well, this concludes our question and answer portion of this presentation. Thank you for attending our meeting this evening. The meeting will be recorded and posted on the park planning website for viewing. If you wish to submit formal public comments, please do so by visiting parkplanning.mps. H-A-L-E dash mosquito 